Visayas, with more than 30 power plants in those regions still offline. Both areas were placed under yellow alert today, and actually that's already a slight improvement for Luzon, which if you recall, was under red yesterday. That's right, Reg. The NGCP says that the Visayas power grid is left with a very thin reserve of only 190 megawatts as a result of the other power plant's limited capacities. Now, the question has been, will this result in rotational blackouts in the coming days? And if so, where? Let's find out from News 5's JC Cosico. Hi, JC. What do you have for us? Reg and Sean, since 1 p.m. today, the Luzon and Visayas grids have been placed under yellow alert status. This means that power reserves are thinning amid higher demand. The yellow alert on the Luzon grid will remain until 11 p.m., while the Visayas grid will remain on yellow alert until 10 p.m. The National Grid Corporation of the Philippines attributed this to the forced outage or unscheduled shutdown of over 30 power plants in Luzon and Visayas. These outages led to the loss of some 2,000 megawatts of power. demand the balance. Hmm. Hindi ako makapag-speculate kung anong naging dahilan, uh, pero maaaring dulot rin yan, nakaagrapate din ang init ng panahon. There are also power plants that are running on the rated or low capacity. Meralcos, meanwhile, says it's unsure whether this could lead to power interruptions in the coming days. It's very difficult to really predict what the actual situation on the ground will be a happy situation we have right now because yellow alert na lamang po tayo. But we still have to be very conscious on uh, the demand situation forecast. Meralco said the Interruptible Load Program or ILP is a huge help. ILP is a demand side management program that allows customers, especially huge companies, to voluntarily use their own power generators and help lessen demand for electricity. Meralco said this program prevented a wider power interruptions in some parts of Luzon yesterday. Itong mga malalaking customers namin ay nag-deload ng capacity of as much as 300 megawatts. 300 megawatts na yun, yun ho yun na pakinabangan ng ating mga kababayan, kasama na po tayo lahat siguro doon, na walang mga sariling generator sets. Kung yung 300 megawatts ay nawala, uh, mas maraming tatamaan na uh, residential areas uh, saan kahapon. Meralco admits though that the ILP is only a stopgap solution. They expect demand to continue to climb by May amid the dry season. And the best solution is to restore the operation of plants that underwent forced outages. Our problem concerns capacity. We need more power plants online, we need more energy. Hopefully, most of this will come online and on stream soon uh, so that when May arrives, meron na tayong pantapat doon sa pagsipa ng uh, demand. Reg Sean, President Marcos has directed the Energy Department to address these power supply issues. He has instructed government offices to lessen their energy consumption to help drive down demand. Back to you. Thank you so much for that, JC Cosico of News 5. So ito na nga, ang nipis ng kuryente. So, and as uh, attorney Cynthia Alabanza of the NGCP said last night, uh, the heat is also affecting the power plant's mm. operations. It's so hot, sometimes pumapalya, nag-overheat yung mga machines, kasama na po tayo dyan. But Maralco does have some power tips. Speaking of uh, Sir Joe Saldariaga, um, yung isa niyang uh, power tip is, dapat daw yung aircon nasa 25 degrees Celsius only. Mm. Which normally... That's As where, opposed to 16 or 17 or 18. Yeah. Right. But Which makes a difference. It makes a big yeah. difference, even in your electricity mm. bill. But I'm usually at 24, mm -hmm. but now I'm at 22. Hindi ko na talaga kaya yung kina. So, I'm going to try. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, check your refs, no? Feel yung side kung tumatagas yung air or yung malamig na hangin kasi nakakasayang yun ng electricity and you'll have to end up paying more also mm -hmm. from your for your power bills. But tight power supply is just one of the problems that we are facing ngayong dry season o tag-init. The other problem that has been in the headlines lately, kaliwat ka ng sunog. Mm. Take a look at this video. 
A volunteer firefighter died after responding to a fire in San Juan City yesterday. Magkakadikit no, yung mga bahay na nasunog, mostly made of light materials. Ang natupok ng apoy. Ang nagyari dun sa firefighter, nadaganan siya. He's 25 years old. Um, nadaganan siya ng gumuguhong debris from one of the houses on fire. And this fire was only put out after two hours. Over 150 families were affected and are currently in an evacuation center. This other video that you're looking at right now on your screens, a dump site in Talisay, Cebu, still covered in smoke from a fire. It took two whole days.
of the Think Tank Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities. Alberto, thanks for making time for us tonight. Welcome to The Big Story. Yeah, happy to be here. Happy, but we're talking about a very serious matter, unfortunately. You heard our report just now. Uh, we're talking about extreme uh, heat in Southeast Asia, record floods in the UAE, Russia, and Kazakhstan. What is the science telling us about global warming? Is this, uh, are these extreme weather events the new norm? Yeah, well, we've known about this for some time now. We've known that uh, the world is approaching a time when uh, extreme weather events will be more and more prevalent. Uh, that time is now. So nothing new really from where I sit. I think that um, uh, we should have really prepared for something like this uh, uh, well. But uh, Alberto, let's uh, take a look at what's happening. Just this year alone, it would seem that this year is more a little bit more extreme if you compare it to the events yes. or weather events last year and then the year before that and so on and so forth. So is it really getting worse or are we just getting bombarded every year so we feel like it's getting worse? For example, when I was a kid, El Nino would happen every so often, not every yeah. summer. Right now, it's like El Nino right after that. It's the Nina and then El Nino again. What's going on? What does the data say? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a cycle. Every time you have El Nino, then you have these heat spells. And every time uh, that happens, as far as the power sector is concerned, there's higher demand. And the power plants operate more difficultly during uh, high temperatures. So um, this is, this is uh, what happens. Uh, uh, I would agree that it has gotten worse recently. Um, this year is particularly bad. Mm -hmm. This year, and then what do you have any idea or data on what the science is telling us that is making it particularly bad this year? Well, you know, I'm not, um, mm -hmm. you know, ICSC has uh, experts on that, mm -hmm. the STBIG uh, particularly. Um, in my interactions with her, she has warned about something like this. You know, it'll be, it, it'll get worse and worse if the world doesn't um, decarbonize. That's why that's uh, the effort that we'd uh, like to do, help the Philippines decarbonize. Uh, ICSC actually put out a press release yesterday coinciding with the NGCP announcement yes. of the red and yellow alerts. And the main takeaway that I took is that the Luzon grid is expected to experience tight power supply in May, yes. particularly from May 13 to 26, uh, potentially leading to yellow alerts as El Nino threatens the country's power yeah. supply. Talk us through that. Yes, uh, we normally prepare this before the second quarter of the year this time. It just so happened that when we scheduled the press, re press conference, we got the red alert and the yellow alert. So uh, I don't know if we have good timing or not, but I think the point that uh, we're making is this. Historically, we've seen forced outages in our baseload power plants. Mm -hmm. Historically, it, it's like every year. That's why in our um, power outlook, we allow for certain amounts of forced outages. Mm -hmm. Even so, we have underpredicted the level of forced outages that we uh, experienced uh, yesterday and up to today. Alberto, would you know how delayed we are in um, building more capacity in terms of power okay. supply? Yeah. yeah. I'd like to talk about that. And I may give a counterintuitive answer. No? Mm -hmm. Everyone says we need more capacity. The point is, what kind of capacity do we need? Many will say probably, ah, we need more baseload power plants. We have too much. You know why we have uh, 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 forced outages? It's because our baseload power plants cannot operate at their peak level every time. If we look at the data on the operations of our coal power plants, our baseload gas power plants, every day they go up and down because that's the nature of our demand. Our demand is low in the early morning. It's highest at noontime, 11 o'clock thereabouts. So there is a huge variability in our load. And the level of baseload power plants today 
it's practically equal to the peak demand. In other words, we have to ramp them down. We have to ramp them down every day. So imagine if you're the base load power plant, you expect to run at a constant level to go ramp down, then you go up the following, you know, at the proper time in the day, then you ramp down again. Parang ano yun eh, na traffic na kotse, instead of just running straight at a steady speed in the highway, it's it's going up and down, and that is harmful to the uh, electrical equipment in the power plants. When you talk about ramp down, you mean from the demand side, meaning consumers have to scale back energy use? No, 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 no. The we have um, innate demand in our system. Mm -hmm. Look at our homes. Look at our homes. At 1 o'clock in the morning, do you consume a lot of power at your home? Probably not, no? Mm -hmm. Probably not. At 12 o'clock, for people like me who work from home, I probably consume a lot of power because my computer is on, air conditioner is on, lights are on, and so on. So my peak demand is probably uh, at around noontime. It's similar to the grid. There's a natural load profile. It's not steady. We build too much base load power plants. Now, we have to ramp them down because there's not enough load. So the danger uh, in the statement that we need to build new power plants is, well, what kind of power plants will you build? If you build more base load, you will add to the problem mm. because you have to ramp down the new capacity as well as the old ones. So what other kinds or types of plants should we be focusing on building? Well, you know, ICSC has always been pro-renewables. Mm -hmm. Renewables are not just solar and wind. Mm -hmm. We have uh, just thermal. We have biomass, which are like base load uh, capacities. ICSC is for a more distributed uh, configuration of the grid. In other words, more power plants, smaller and spread out. That is the proper configuration for a country, an archipelago like the Philippines. Instead, what we have are large clusters of power plants in the south of Luzon, in uh, Quezon. Now, we've, we've taken a look at this. If there's a single typhoon at the appropriate path, in just one pass uh, over uh, uh, the Philippines at the appropriate path, over 3,000 megawatts will be hit of capacity. That's immediate uh, blackout for a long time. Now... If we have a more distributed system, smaller power plants at appropriate uh, locations, then we would be uh, less susceptible to such kinds of weather events. So that's what ICSC wants to do. We want a more distributed, we want a more diverse system. Now, the, the easy way to address a, a problem like this is, ah, let's have more power plants. Let's throw more base load. That will make it worse. Okay. The uh, government wants uh, renewables to uh, make yeah. up 35% of the country's energy mix yes. by 2030. We're about yes. six years out from that. That's a target. Uh, and 50% by 2040. Are you saying we're not on track to hit those targets? I'm saying that uh, we're, we're far from the 35 and the, and the 50 we are only 22%. only 22% of renewables. I'd like to say that when I was in the government, when I was in the government at the Ministry of Energy during the time of former President Ferdinand Marcos, hmm. we went in 1984 to 52% renewables because we developed hydro and geothermal. 52% in 1984. So... It's not like we haven't done it before. We've done it before. I think that uh, with the proper um, uh, policy, we can do it likewise. Alberto, uh, I would like to circle back to what you said that most of our plants are, of course, large base load capacity plants. Yes. And they're all clustered together. Why are they clustered together? Is there any specific reason that they are, in fact, clustered together? Yeah, well, one reason is you need access to a large body of water if you're a uh, thermal power plant. Another reason is there are ideal um, locations in the grid 
that uh, will uh, allow you to connect to the transmission system. What we need is a system that will allow more power plants to be built in more locations. That has been a challenge for NGCP. And um, my hope and uh, my wish is for them to address that challenge. And in the short term, between uh, April to June, as per your uh, the Philippine Power Outlook report that ICSC just put out, what's one recommendation that you have for the government to, to, to help us ensure a stable and continuous power supply? You know, power is a long-term game. Mm -hmm. There's nothing we can do to address the <laughs> situation in May and in June. So the, mm -hmm. what the government is doing, what the private sector is doing, like Maralco, ILP, interruptible load, energy efficiency, all of this will help. All of this will help. But, you know, I've been in um, energy planning for over 40 years. I hope we realize our problem is not more base load power plants. That is, in a, that will just add to our problems. What about the nuclear power plant? You mentioned you were in the energy sector in, in the term of former President Marcos Sr. Yeah, yeah like are you... There's talk now of uh, building another yeah. nuclear power plant. Your thoughts on that? Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the nuclear power plant. Everyone talks about the Bataan nuclear power plant. But no one talks about Kalayaan pump storage hydro. From an energy planner like me, that's very, very important. The 620 megawatt nuclear power plant is very big relative to the demand at that time. And therefore, you needed some sort of a battery. A pump storage hydro is like a battery. You store the water when you have excess electricity and in a higher basin, and then you let it uh, produce uh, when you have uh, less available electricity at another part of the day. So every time you say nuclear power plant before, it was the nuclear power plant and the Kalayan pump storage power plant that would have worked in conjunction with each other to address the problems at that time. Mm. Now, mm. nuclear power plant is a base load power plant. It is less flexible than coal, less flexible than gas. My personal view is it is too big. Commercial technologies, are, nuclear technologies are too big for our system. It will just add to the problem. That is my personal view. Uh, we're going to have to leave that there for now. Thanks for sharing your insights. Alberto De Luzon, Energy Transition Advisor of Think Tank Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities. We're going to pause for a quick one right now, but right after that, the BSP warns that the peso is taking a hit from rising tensions between the Philippines and China. We'll also get some insights from top economist Jonathan Ravelas when we return. Keep it here in One News.
expects the economy to grow 6.2% as well, slightly higher than its January forecast of 6.1%. As for inflation, the IMF estimates that it'll average at around 3.6% this year and 3% for 2025. That is well within the government's target range of between 2 to 4%. And with the latest numbers, the Philippines would become the fastest-growing economy in the region. The fund says that is due to carryover from a better-than-expected run in the last quarter of 2023. In the medium term, the IMF says structural reforms to close the infrastructure and education gaps, attract FDI, and harness the benefits of a digital economy should propel growth even higher. Let's try to break these economic forecasts down. Yes, we have uh, Jonathan Ravelas joining us. Jonathan is a senior advisor over at Reyes Takandong and Company and also the managing director at eManagement for Business and Marketing Services. Jonas, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Just as the peso Long has time reached. no see. I know, 57 <laughs> to a dollar. Jonathan comes out only on the big news days. <laughs> good evening, everyone. So, um, I, I guess uh, 57, uh, nothing to really be worried about. I think it just came in with uh, two things in mind. Uh, you have to understand that uh, what happened the past few days has been very significant for the Philippine financial markets. First, uh, we saw uh, interest rate yields moving higher by 33 basis points. I'm talking about the 10-year BVAL. The second, the stock market falling below 6.5. And then eventually, the peso breaching uh, 57. So uh, the BSP governor highlighted geopolitical concerns, particularly for the Philippines and China. Uh, I think the other thing is that uh, with the Israel and Iran uh, and Hamas, uh, the geopolitical tensions globally, I think, has risen twice uh, compared to last month. So this has eventually created... Uh, an additional worry for investors. So the dollar got stronger. The what? other one was basically more driven by the U.S. Fed, very similar to the statements that uh, any cuts would have uh, probably been pushed later back this year. So that actually created uh, a period for a strong dollar. Well, uh, so what? this is, I think, the, the main reason why we're at 57 Okay, but uh, in terms of like small movements in the in the exchange rate between the PHP and the USD, though, uh, according to the BSP governor, he was he's been closely watching, and the BSP has been closely watching these movements. And every time there is some sort of incident over at the West Philippine Sea, he notices movements that, of course, does not favor the peso uh, soon after or on the next trading day. Uh, what would you have to say to that? Did you notice these uh, same little movements? Okay, let me put it this way. I, I would not look at the those events, but I'd look at at the end of the at the end of 2023. The peso was trading uh, uh, ended the year at 55.37. In the first quarter, uh, we've seen that uh, compared to previously, uh, the peso would normally move between 15 to 30 centavos a day. But uh, in the first quarter of the year, the peso was averaging between. Uh, uh, around 50 to almost 1 peso in terms of trading range. Mm -hmm. So this is eventually accounting for uh, a lot of uh, sort of a shock absorber to all of these uh, situations. So uh, what I'm just saying is that there's a wider range for the peso to move, uh, but we've seen a very good performance, a gradual movement in terms of that the market isn't worried about. So in the first quarter, we saw from 55.37 all the way to 56.50. Uh, the market wasn't worried about any volatility. It's only now that we breached 57, uh, particularly driven by a couple of factors. And one of them, of course, is the more heightened China-Philippine relations. And of course, I think what really adds to the worry is that the Fed is signaling um, higher rates for longer. And when a currency, uh, when a country continues to keep uh, the rates on the high side, the demand for their 
uh, assets becomes higher. So people are flocking to the dollar uh, for investments. No? So this is also another reason why uh, the dollar is a bit stronger, even in other against other currencies. And since you brought up heightened geopolitical uh, risks, uh, I have to ask you, when you look at the landscape right now, we're talking not just the flashpoint in the South China Sea, but also uh, growing tensions in the Middle East, which actually have escalated in the past several days. Uh, also, there's Ukraine. Uh, we're more than two years into the war. Uh, do any of these worry you? Do, will, will any of that yes. hit the currency? Uh, well, I guess this actually adds to the idea. I think uh, my, my base case, uh, I think the last time I was interviewed uh, at the big story was basically looking at the year end of 5550. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, with this geopolitical tensions, it seems that uh, we might be uh, expecting probably closer to 5750 or 58 by year end pricing these geopolitical tensions. Right now, we're probably, as I said earlier, uh, the, the geopolitical uncertainty has jumped two times compared to the previous month. Now, as we move to the fourth quarter, you have to price in Trump 2.0. So that will lead to more trade wars, and that means the dollar will eventually uh, take center stage. And as China has been doing with the trade wars, they've allowed their currency to depreciate. So competitive devaluation could be another uh, new set of words to be used towards end of the year. Wait, you're already pricing in I know, you're already. I said, <laughs> we're <laughs> still more than six months out, Jonas. I'm not over the uh, the prediction, your year-end forecast also for the past. So, uh, but you don't seem worried. So at no point, point we, <laughs> I know. That's why he's pricing okay. it in already. Uh -huh. If you look at the a weaker peso, and if you recall, uh, in 2022, one, one of the bigger drivers with a slightly weaker peso is that it boosts tourism. Mm -hmm. Hopefully by then, uh, the, the weaker peso will probably happen in the second half, a uh, much greater, so that hopefully a lot of people, especially in the summertime of Americans, they'd probably come to the Philippines because the peso is slightly weaker. Okay, so well, that's actually good for tourism. Now, it might be bad a little bit for inflation, but uh, hopefully we don't get to see oil uh, going beyond 100. Because right now, it seems that the uncertainty is rising. You have to understand that at the start of the year, people were very optimistic that rate cuts would materialize. So what happened is that people were so uh, gung-ho in buying the stock market. People were expecting that government will continue its infra program. Uh, but suddenly, all of a sudden, we're starting to have this inflation fears. Mm -hmm. So my worry is that if uh, the extreme heat will continue, and mm -hmm. just like the previous uh, uh, topic that you had on electricity, mm -hmm. uh, they all boil down to higher prices and means higher inflation. So if inflation surpasses 5% in the coming months, then that could be another worry. And this is not only in the Philippines, but the rest of the world. So the risk there could be more uh, shifting to a tightening bias. So that's something to be worried about. Okay, well, all that is happening and the peso breached 57. We have the IMF and the, I and the ADB forecasting for the Philippines to have, you know, one of the highest growth rates or GDPs in the region. What do we make of this? 6.2% for IMF, 6% for ADB just for this year alone. Mm -hmm. Do you see the okay. same? No, I'm looking at 5.8%. I'm realistic. <laughs> so basically, I think one thing to think about is that it's con our economy is consumption driven. So 70% is all about consumption. So the key strategy is that if inflation eventually improves, then definitely we can sustain our uh, consumption patterns. Okay? I think one other upside is that a weaker peso is good for OFW remittances. That's always good. But um, So you see inflation persisting into how long? And will it flatten okay. out at some point? Well, I'm just hoping that it will not go beyond, I think, until the first half, the risk is closer to 5%. Okay, so and hopefully after the first half, we should see it coming down. 
So, so the IMF is seeing 3.6% inflation for this year average and next year's average at 3%. Would that be fair to say that it would fit into the 2 to 4% target band of the BSP? I'm looking at 3.9%. So hopefully uh, the rains come in the second half. Pasok pa rin. Pasok pa rin. So hopefully, <laughs> but I, I think that what is critical is the first half. So mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, with the extreme heat, like you mentioned earlier, that probably we could see the peak, the peak heat in May. Uh, again, uh, that that will still spur, spur inflationary pressures probably until June. So uh, you talk about from an agriculture perspective, that will mean higher prices, low productivity. Uh, when we talk about energy, that still means higher prices. And then, of course, the impact of raising demand on the side of consumers uh, for power, that, that will also mean inflationary. And uh, one thing, uh, people uh, will less get out of their houses, will mean less economic activity. So that, I think, mm. uh, becomes a challenge. So I still believe the 5.8% mm -hmm. target of mine is still achievable for uh, GDP. Okay, we're going to have to call you in the second half and see how things change as the weather shifts. But, but in the meantime, <laughs> he's pricing in the worst-case scenarios already. Yeah, okay. I know. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Thank you so much for your time tonight, Jonathan Rovellas. <laughs> Senior Advisor at Reyes Takandong and Company and also Managing Director at E-Management for Businesses and Marketing Services. We're going to pause for a quick one. Right after that, the MMDA begins issuing tickets to e-bike and e-trike users caught using national roads. The details when the big story returns. Keep it here. started its crackdown on e-bikes and tricycles on national roads earlier today. So, how many were apprehended so far? Let's find out from Jenny Dongon, who has the whole story. Go ahead, Jenny. Sean MMDA personnel and local enforcers had their focus on apprehending light electric vehicles such as e-bikes and e-trikes that were traversing on main roads despite the total ban in place. The directive to ban light electric vehicles and colleagues on the main road in Metro Manila was implemented on Monday. But during the first two days, the MMDA refrained from apprehending violators. Today, apprehensions began. 
yung food and drink, yung mabayben po yun eh. Pero binabayin niyo pa rin po yung kaba niyo. Wala po, dyan lang po galing oh. Alam ko naman po kaso tatay doon sa nakakubos eh. The Manila Traffic and Parking Bureau personnel apprehended two e-trikes that were traveling along Recto Avenue despite the ban on such vehicles on the main roads of Metro Manila. Since the start of the ban, Manila personnel have already apprehended close to 200 violators. According to the MMDA, the existing ordinance is clear. Tricycles, pushcarts, pedicabs, kuligvigs, and light e-vehicles such as e-bikes and e-trikes are now prohibited on almost 20 main roads or national roads in Metro Manila. They are only allowed on roads within communities. Those caught violating will automatically receive tickets and fines. Vehicles may also be impounded if they are unregistered or if the driver does not have a license. Despite this, there are some drivers who still seem unaffected. Take this driver, for example, who already got a ticket this morning but was caught again passing through Recto this afternoon. Apart from Manila, there were also some e-bikes and e-tricycles towed near Etzataf in Pasay this afternoon. Based on MMDA data, from morning until noon, they've issued tickets to nearly 90 vehicles. 19 vehicles, on the other hand, were towed or impounded. Sean, as of 5 p.m., 132 vehicles were apprehended, and that number will continue to rise as MMDA and local enforcers continue with their operation. Sean. Thank you so much for those updates. News 5's Jenny Dongot. Really uh, keeping true to their word, no? <laughs> they, they have started apprehending really, uh, nine, at least 19 impounded. I really like it. I really like how they've been apprehending non-stop at the busway and every so day. Okay, they have oh, one high-profile person. Rule. <laughs> Well, yeah, talking about Chavit Singson. Chavit uh, Singson and then uh, the driver the, of Chase Escudero and today PBA player yeah, Raymond Almazan. Right, that's right. Mm -hmm. so, the rule applies to all is what the MMDA mm -hmm. says. Uh, but also today marks just 100 days before the Philippines officially embarks on its 100th year in the Olympics. With this in mind, Philippine sports officials orchestrated a symbolic relay event at the SM Mall of Asia, as you can see. Coinciding with the lighting of the Paris 2024 Olympic flame in ancient Greece. And that's highly symbolic as ancient Olympia is, of course, the birthplace of the Games. Greek actress Mary Mina played the role of the high priestess and lit the torch. French ambassador in the Philippi to the Philippines, Marie Fontanelle, and Greek ambassador Eunice Pedro Ped Pediotics spearheaded the commencement of the event at the Mall of Asia. And the relay signifies the start of a series of events leading up to the opening day of the Olympic Games in July. In case you're wondering, currently there are nine Filipino athletes that have already qualified for the Olympics and they are busy, of course, with their respective training camps. The Philippine Sports Commission hopes that there will be more athletes that will qualify for the Games in the coming weeks. Currently, the Philippine Olympic Committee is busy preparing to ensure a flawless and memorable Olympic campaign for Team Philippines. Through our partnership with the Philippine Sports Commission, we are able to finalize Olympic training camp in France for Team Philippines as they further push for the actual games starting on July 26 this summer. As a side note, it's also 100 days to my birthday, which coincides with the start with the of the Olympics. Yes. Oh, okay. I think the last I time this happened was when I was 10 years old with the Barcelona games. I don't think we can compare the two, but. I definitely know which one I'll be attending. Yeah, but you know that those were the first games when I was starting. You know, the kakamale na ako, and then Onyok Velasco won a silver. Oh, and it was then, that year. Yeah, it was that year. And then now, like we can see, we have so many people like who can actually nine, so no? many athletes. Nine, and I think which we're part? eyeing a total of twelve or thirteen athletes. Ooh, so here's hoping we get to that. Yes, but before we go, we still have something for you. Our big picture for tonight. I haven't forgotten. We have this photo of Naia Terminal 1 worker, Victor Perez.
the Manila International Airport Authority commended Perez for his honesty after returning $10,000 or over 565 thousand pesos that he found on the floor while working at Terminal 1 last Saturday. Perez is one of the airport's porters and he handed the money over to the airport's lost and found office. A Korean national confirmed as the rightful owner through CCTV footage reclaimed his cash. The MIAA said that Perez has been working at the NAIA for 32 years. The following day, it was the turn of a Terminal 3 security guard to surrender a lost item. The bag found at Terminal 3's Base 7 contained a gold necklace, a laptop, a smartphone, which the owner has already claimed. That was on Tuesday. Now both airport workers will be officially commended in Mia's flag ceremony next month. As they should, because uh, it's, it's nice that we don't always report about bad things happening at the airport. Right? And two, two good news. Occasionally, things. things like this happen. Honesty, show of honesty, uh, airport workers reta returning lost items. High value items yes. at that, $10,000. There are so many, but I think um, maybe it's also us making it focusing no, uh, on the bad no news. overshadow because mm. of the bad news. That's also true. So, uh, I mean, yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to compete with the bad news sometimes because, I mean, when you have yeah. stories like the airport screener swallowing mm -hmm. the cash, right? That's so sensational yeah. that it travels much faster than mm -hmm. stories like this. Stories like this. Stories like this of Good Samaritans returning what's not theirs. We should the have a good news segment. I think this is the good news segment, the yeah. big picture. <laughs> All right, it is a Wednesday.